Next up, we have our second and only other talk for today, which is around why crypto and privacy have not really found that perfect match. And talking about this topic are going to, is going to be Elena from Ironfish. So please give Elena a massive round of applause. Hello. Okay, awesome. Um, cool. So I want to talk to you about uh, privacy and crypto and why we actually still don't have a solution for it. Um, How to cut up this work? I can, I can just do it with the too. I think it might be a click missing. Let's try that. Okay, so who am I? Um, I've been working on a project called Ironfish for quite some time now. Um, Ironfish is a layer one protocol. It's a privacy protocol. We've been full, fully mainnet launched since April of last year. Uh, we're actually the only mainnet launch privacy chain that supports custom assets, uh, uh, custom assets as well. Um, and I've been in crypto since like 2019. And so for, since 2019, I've been trying to figure out how do we can have a privacy layer for crypto. Um, and unfortunately, almost five years in, we actually still don't have a solution. <laughs> So, okay, <laughs> let's say I have a friend, uh, Kartik, um, and I want to send him some assets. Um, and, um, you know, maybe I don't want to be associated with Kartik for various reasons, or maybe the fact that the tokens are going to be leaving my account is going to signal something to, some, some, something to the market. Um, maybe I'm a whale. Uh, or maybe I don't want to give a future fisher more information about myself because now they know that they can impersonate Kartik and ask more money from me, um, that, and that's not really good either. Uh, or maybe Kartik is my therapist, and again, I don't want that uh, transaction to be uh, out in the open and, and available. Um, or maybe simply I just don't want my transactions to be public. Um, and again, there's a lot of reasons for why people might want private transactions. It's actually a very odd paradigm that they're not. Um, and there's plenty of other reasons why we might want privacy in crypto. For instance, financial institutions, they actually need privacy. For them, it's not just a moral right, it's a necessity for their business. Um, whales do move the market just by placing an order, especially during the NFT craze. There were actual bots that would mimic transactions made by certain accounts. Um, donations to campaigns stay with your wallet forever. So for instance, recently there was a US citizen who was also a Russian citizen from Los Angeles. She went back to Russia and she was arrested because she donated $51 to Ukraine. Um, so that stays with you forever. Your ENS name that sometimes people use on Twitter, um, that is basically a price tag over your head. Um, and then phishing, spear phishing attacks are way easier with transparency because again, if I know more about you and your past transactions, I can craft an attack that better targets you. Um, if you ever wanted to do payroll with crypto, it's kind of a weird paradigm to have all your payroll information to be completely out in the open. So for the duration of this talk, let's focus on this just one goal, which is I want to send 20 USDC from account A to account B privately. And to make this a little bit more believable because of inflation, uh, 100 is the new 20. <laughs> so what protocol out there can facilitate this transaction? And uh, I'm going to give some other caveats. So I want this protocol to actually work well, and I want this protocol to give the privacy that the users want and deserve at the price that they actually want. And I don't want bad guys to use this protocol too, um, because I do want this, pro this protocol to have a viable future. <laughs> and if you let bad guys use it, then it kind of violates that rule. So crypto ha has, has had a number of attempts on privacy. Um, so some of the OG privacy protocols are these monolithic, isolate, isolated, non-interoperable um, protocols that typically only support one asset. And so those are things like Monero or Zcash or Grin, Beam, et cetera. Um, and then I, there's these, what I call the next generation privacy protocols. And those are typically ZK based, they're interoperable, and they're overall more exciting, um, but they're not quite there yet. So again, I want to go back to this example. I want to send 100 USDC from account A to account B privately. Um, what protocol lets me do that? And so some protocols have world-class cryptography, but are isolated and non-interoperable. So for instance, even though Zcash is, has probably the best cryptography out there, I can't use Zcash to send 100 USDC to, to Kartik. That just doesn't work. Um, some protocols use what, what 
like T's, which are the same for trust execution environments or enclaves. Um, and I think that's cheating. I don't think that's real privacy. So I don't think that quite, work, uh, quite works. Um, some privacy protocols have actually pivoted away from privacy for various reasons. Um, so for instance, if you guys heard of a project called Nocturne, I thought they had a really cool approach to privacy. Um, and unfortunately, a few weeks ago, they announced that they're no longer pursuing that goal. Espresso systems, again, pivoted away to focus on shared sequencers. Um, and so again, we're seeing kind of protocols shy away from privacy and focusing on other things. Um, some privacy protocols have killed off their own products, which is a little sad, but they will relaunch. Um, and some, pro some privacy protocols have not launched yet. So for instance, Alio, Nomada, Penumbra, and a few others um, are super cool, but they're not out yet. So I can't actually use them to send my 100 USDC uh, to Kartik. Um, and some privacy protocols like Ironfish have launched, but again, I can't quite use it yet um, for my example, but I will be able to soon. <laughs> um, and some privacy protocols do exist in their chains, but they're not quite used. And honestly, they're not quite, they're not quite private. And there was one privacy protocol that actually came close uh, to, being, to being able to solve my use case of sending that USDC privately. Uh, and unfortunately, it has been sanctioned. And the crazy thing about this is that it actually shows the demand in the market for a privacy protocol. Because this privacy protocol, who shall not be named, <laughs> was sanctioned. Uh, its governance token was hacked. Its founders were arrested. And yet, right now, if you go to DeFi Llama, it's still top 50 uh, DeFi protocols with over, <laughs> with almost half a billion locked in, <laughs> locked in there. Um, but, but I still can't use it, right? So for privacy protocols out there, it's like squid games. You kind of like look around and you're like, oh no, <laughs> am I next? <laughs> um, so at this moment in time, there's still not a single protocol that I, as a US citizen, can use to transfer money privately from account A to account B. So aside from technical challenges of privacy protocols, and those are super fascinating, um, I'm actually going to talk more about the compliance in the screening section, um, because that is actually pretty important, especially since a lot of us have unlaunched privacy protocols. And I think a lot of us are thinking about this of how do we launch a protocol that, again, has a future and won't let bad guys use it. Um, so really, like, how do we as the developers build a privacy solution that genuinely deters bad actors and makes regulators comfortable. And we are going to focus on this last one of what makes regulators comfortable. Um, and typically, for crypto, people are mostly concerned about the SEC. So for instance, a lot of you know founders and projects and so on spend a lot of brain cycles thinking of like, how do I write a blog post? Am I allowed to publish a roadmap, et cetera, in fear that the SEC may dislike that. But we're actually not going to focus on the SEC at all. We're going to focus on a couple of other departments um, within the Treasury Department itself. So the Treasury Department has a lot of departments underneath it. It's actually a huge conglomerate, and all of them are equally scary. But the two that we're really going to focus on is OFAC and FinCEN. So we can kind of condense this graph to just these two entities. Um, and these two entities are extremely important. And I think every single crypto project should focus on that, especially privacy protocol. And I'm not a lawyer, definitely not your lawyer. <laughs> this is gross oversimplification of all this. Um, but we did spend a considerable amount of time talking to lawyers about all this. Um, and I think all of this is actually fairly important. So for FinCEN, you can kind of think of FinCEN as just focusing on the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, and so under this, uh, sorry, of course, not yet. So under BSA, FinCEN requires that a money transmitter or an MSB um, conduct certain reporting rules to report suspicious activity to prevent money laundering or terrorism financing or other illicit activity. Okay, that sounds great, but what makes you a money transmitter? And by you, I mean what makes a protocol or a protocol developer a money transmitter? Because if you are one, then again, you have a lot, you have to do a lot of these other kind of requirements uh, to facilitate that compliance. Um, so you don't actually want to do that. So in 2019, FinCEN gave us guidance on what this means for privacy protocols in particular, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and the TLDR of that is that an anonymizing software provider by itself is not a money transmitter, which is pretty great news. But then what happened last year in August of 2023 
um, is that the two Tornado Cash founders were arrested and they were indicted with three counts. Um, and count two was actually conspiracy to operate an unlicensed money transmitter business. Okay, so this is, gets kind of interesting because they were a protocol and they were protocol developers and now they're being tried as an MSB. Um, so that's not good. <laughs> and if you really read the whole court case, the TLDR of that is that relayers provided customers with enhanced anonymity in exchange for a fee, um, making this fall under MSB requirements. Because again, an MSB is a business that uh, provides a service that takes a fee for transmitting value. So we can kind of condense this or summarize this um, as a protocol that provides users with some service, any service that produces revenue is now an MSB. And this is kind of scary because it actually uh, means that protocols, they're not just privacy protocols should really pay attention because technically all bridges and all relayers uh, can fall under this requirement um, if they take fees for the services that they provide of mo moving money for their users. Um, and even if you don't take fees directly, which is kind of what this court case alluded to, uh, but the protocol's token appreciates in value due to you providing a service that can also count, um, which is, again is kind of interesting uh, because what they argued is that even though, e even if they didn't take like really our transaction fees, if the Tor token went up in value because more people used it, then effectively you are taking a fee uh, or taking revenue. Um, and unfortunately, even though none of this is set in stone, it makes it really hard for privacy protocols to make partnerships or to work with other businesses uh, just mostly because of fear. So this is largely unresolved and not yet enforced. So all this sounds scary, but it's kind of still pretty much in flux. Um, and there is something scarier. <laughs> and so if we go back to this graph, the scarier um, department here is actually OFAC. And OFAC kind of deals with sanctions list. So a sanctions list basically means if you are a US person or entity, you do not touch the sanctions list. Um, and the sanctions list is basically, you know, uh, individuals or even countries who you cannot interact with financially. And it's unforgiving, meaning that for FinCEN, you actually have to uh, prove whether or not you had intent to make that crime. But for sanctions, it's unforgiving in terms that they have no obligation to prove intent or violation. If you violated sanctions, you are at fault. Um, and so then the question is, well, for protocols and protocol developers, how do they get around this? Because we're building crypto to be this global product where typically we don't put restrictions on who uses it. So how, how should we think about this? Um, so what is the OFAC requirement for protocols? Um, and they did have some guidance um, in the FAQ section of when they sanctioned Tornado Cash. And they said that privacy preserving protocol or software by itself does not need to have um, OFAC requirements. But then it's kind of juxtapositioned with them sanctioning Tornado. And so as a protocol developer, this becomes very confusing of how you can actually operate under this um, under this set of facts. <laughs> um, and so for protocol developers, um, a US individual or an entity, there's a pretty clear requirement that you do need to follow, follow OFAC sanction obligations. Um, so even though your protocol doesn't, you specifically personally do, because whereas for FinCEN, your company might get sued, but for OFAC, you personally get sued. And I don't think anyone here in this room wants to go up against the US government, regardless of whether or not you think you can win. Um, and so one of the counts that the Tornado Cash founders were, um, were arrested for is this count three, which is con conspiracy to violate basically the sanctions list. And the argument here is that since Tornado, the company ran its own relayers, they received fees from sanctioned addresses and therefore they have directly um, transacted with a sanctioned address. And this one is going to be fairly easy for them to prove. And out of all the counts, this is probably the more serious one that they're facing. Um, so again, this actually should be scary for protocols outside of just privacy protocols, specifically bridges and L2s, because if you are running a single sequencer, there's only one party that's taking transaction fees, and you're taking fee from a sanctioned address, then technically you have violated the same thing they did. 
Um, and same same argument for, for bridges. Typically bridges either have a tight quorum of validators or sometimes they even call the relayers. <laughs> um, and therefore you're directly falling under the same argument that got Tornado Cash in trouble. Okay, but really let's just focus on this example. I know like we went on this whole tangent, um, but really again, we just wanna send money from account A to account B privately. Um, so how do we do this without, you know, being sued by the US government and doing so in, with good ethics. Um, so instead of looking at, like, looking at it like this, let's break it down in terms of this. So you can look at uh, interacting with the privacy protocol kind of in three steps. The first step is the ingress. Value has to go from a transparent environment to a private environment. Um, and transactions then happen within the privacy protocol. So typically people can move, swap, transact however they want within the privacy protocol. And then eventually a person may want to leave the privacy protocol and go back to their transparent environment. Um, so for us, for this example, um, if I wanted to do a USDC transaction privately, I would first send it to Ironfish or another privacy pool. Um, then I would transact with it however, however I want. And then Card or, or whoever else would then be able to take the money out. So we have a choice of where we can do the screening. So we can either do the screening on the ingress when money comes in, we can either do screening within the privacy protocol itself, um, or we can do it on the egress when money leaves the, the protocol. Um, so if we screen within the privacy protocol, it's kind of a Pandora's box of problems. Um, one such example of how you can do that is you can have a global view key. And if you're familiar with a project called Cape by Espresso, that's kind of what they did. Um, and so the idea is that if you have this global view key, then someone kind of looks at all the transactions and makes sure that no bad actors are using the protocol um, while still keeping it private to everybody else. And there's a lot of problems with this. First, it sounds bad. Who wants a global view key in their privacy protocol? Um, second, it's a huge overhead on the team because now someone has to monitor all the transactions and keep track of this global view key, which is a huge OPSEC and a lot of risk for hack and, da and data loss. Um, and if the team is actually responsible for monitoring all the transactions using this global view key, then there's even a stronger argument to be, to be made that they are an MSB. You don't want that either. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of problems with this approach. Um, and uh, so typically, let's, we, we, we don't really look at that. Um, so then we can kind of put an encrypted tracer on all the UTXO models or on, on all the UTXO nodes. Um, and we actually looked at this approach for quite some time. And technically, this is a very interesting approach, uh, but it does ha have a lot of problems with it too. So for instance, again, if an account wants to deposit some money into the privacy layer, um, and Alice then wants to send to Bob some money within the privacy layer, the idea is that you have an encrypted tracer that keeps track of all the previous owners for that, um, for that note. Um, and so you know, this encrypted blob pretty much grows with each transaction. Um, and to preserve privacy, we can, we can encrypt it and, can, and it can only be decrypted with like an NPC or a DAO, et cetera, um, such that it can only be decrypted if there's a suspicious cause or if there's a reason for you to, to want to look at that history. And that's a pretty bad idea too because you have this growing data set, that's not good. Um, again, having a tracer sounds pretty bad. Um, having a party to decrypt past history sounds like a lot as well. Um, because then the question is like, well, what is considered suspicious? Who actually does the decryption? Um, and so overall, this particular approach, even though theoretically possible, not super practical. Um, cool, so then we can have a consensus enforced block list. So for Ironfish, we actually seriously consider this approach. And the idea basically is that if we detect that there's a bad address, we can prevent that address from ever creating a transaction, the protocol, by, by consensus. Um, and the problem with that is that time is really against you. If I'm a bad person, if I'm a hacker, um, then I'll probably move my funds extremely quickly, much faster than you can update your consensus layer to prevent me from doing so in the future. Um, and then there's a weird jurisdiction question. So for instance, for Ironfish, we have miners all around the world. A lot of miners, for instance, are in China. Should they follow the US sanctions list or should they follow the Chinese sanctions list? Um, because Nancy Pelosi is actually in the Chinese sanctions list. So does that mean that we can't process her transactions? Um, so then it kind of kind of is a Pandora's box of, of, of that question, <laughs> which we really did not want to address. Um, so then you can do egress, which um, I don't know if you guys remember, but Vitalik and Amin published this paper in association sets, which basically means that 
if you have multiple parties going into the privacy protocol, if I want to ever withdraw that money, um, I have to present to you an association set of past transactions that have to include my own. And so the idea is, for instance, if I'm Alice, I can say, well, um, you know, upon, upon withdrawing, I can say I'm either Alice, Bob, Carl, or David, but you don't know who I am, and I'm not, I'm not going to include Eve because I know Eve is a bad person. Um, now, Eve could not say the same statement because Eve has to include herself, and if we know that Eve is bad, then the association said that she has to present will include a bad address, which is herself. Um, the problem with that is you have to know that Eve is bad, <laughs> and that's actually really hard, and again, you're racing against time because hackers move funds very quickly, um, and this kind of breaks if you allow transactions within the privacy pool itself. So while we actually did look, look at association sets, we eventually decided not to move forward with those either. Um, so ingress is the simplest of them all. So ingress basically means that when you're moving funds into the privacy protocol, that is when you have the most information about who is trying to use that privacy protocol. Um, and uh, at that point, you can actually effectively utilize allow lists and block lists. And the idea really is that when an account is trying to move money into the privacy protocol, they first have to go through what I would call a decision maker. So this could be a bridge or a smart contract bridge or a relayer or whatever party or protocol is responsible for moving, thing, moving funds into the privacy protocol. And at that point, that decision maker can check a list. Uh, they can check an allow list or a block list to see that uh, account A is not a bad person. Um, and these lists can be derived from on-chain sanctions lists. So chain analysis actually provides you an on-chain sanctions list. You can have any of one of your protocols check against that list first, um, which is honestly pretty good. Like you can at least say that you've tried this, you know, versus not trying anything at all. Um, the downside is that if you actually want accuracy, you probably have to have like a 24-hour delay because that on-chain sanctions list does not get updated instantaneously. Um, and uh, alternatively, if you had more of a centralized approach, you could just use a real-time threat detection system. Um, so you could use all the fancy schmancy technology that possibly available if you're a centralized system monitoring all the transactions they're trying to enter the privacy pool. Um, so that's actually what we chose. <laughs> uh, so we're working with a bridge operator who is um, monitoring all the transactions that are coming in with real-time threat detection model. Um, the downside is that you do have a more centralized approach, but the upside is that you have a lot more control. Um, and so that is actually coming quite soon, like in roughly three months. So very soon, you'll be able to finally use the example that I just proposed of moving funds in and out of a privacy protocol without allowing bad actors. So that, that's all. Thank you.